All right. So, as I mentioned in my last video, take two. Um, this is take two of the railroad. As I have admitted last session, um, I, I have used, reused campaigns every now and then. Especially if there were campaigns that I really found fun, uh, put a lot of time in. And, and this one was no different because it was probably some of the most fun I have ever had playing a campaign. And it has only recently been topped by another campaign, which I'll get into at some point. The idea of the campaign was, is they were, um, it, it, it was a Vampire the Masquerade campaign where they all played uh, vampires. They're basically half vampires. Now, in difference to most stuff where you see half vampires, like in Castlevania, and, and Vampire Hunter D, where they're kind of like these, like, walking badasses. Or, God help you, the Blade movies, where they're just, you know, gods. You know, they, they got all the powers of a vampire. No, no they don't. Because none of the vampires were anywhere near near that strong what about the vampire god don't forget about the vampire god that was a great oh, oh yeah yeah not, not even the vampire god was that strong it's just 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 big dracula himself wasn't even that strong and blades like oh yeah i can oh, i can totally beat you <sighs> anyway so yeah you know these ones were relatively weak i mean i mean they were slightly better then, uh, ghouls from the Vampire of the Masquerade world. And they're about on terms of the same power, possibly even underpowered, depending on how you look at it, as revenants. Which, I know you don't know what a revenant is. A revenant is, um, basically, in Vampire of the Masquerade, when, when a vampire, like, feeds a human their blood, they, they gain some of the vampire's powers, and, you know, they can get the cool, like, special vampire abilities, and are, they get kind of strong, and they live longer as long as they kept supplied with bloods. And, and the classic example is Renfield, you know, they're, they're like servants of the master, and the master gives them power, and they have some power in their own right. A revenant is essentially when two of these ghouls make a baby, and that baby is essentially just a ghoul permanently. And I came to my first group, my classic group, you know with 3Q McThrow stuff, Catman that won't put his phone down, and Sephiroth, I always play McSephiroth, Sephiroth. It's a nasty name. With a, with, with, a, with a side dish of Sephiroth and some Sephiroth to dip in. I first played it with them, and I actually made their characters for them because they were all, like, in a juvenile detention hall because I wanted to have a scene in 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 juvie. You know, well they 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 met up in juvie specifically at a um, uh, anger management because they were half vampire. They they you know were prone prone to uh, bouts of anger, and all of them did things like I'll just kind of give you a brief rundown of the backstories right now. Uh, one of them was the. Uh, he was this, like, star athlete type kid, you know, because he's a vampire, so he's got the, 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 the vampire move fast powers and vampire strong powers. So, you know, he's, you know, he's this athlete, he's, he's really good at all the things he does, you know, and his, and his mom is just so proud of him because, you know, look at this great child she made. His setup was, um, at the big track meet, you know, he lost because the classic bully you always see in these sports movies blatantly cheated to win, you know? And the ref didn't see it because, you know, daddy's rich and daddy paid off the judge. So after, you know, complaining to the judge, and of course mommy comes over and how could you do this to me? How could you make me look so bad like this? You know, that type of mother. He uh, went into a frenzy, grabbed a nearby javelin, and javelined the kid through the leg. Specifically through the shit. And I, and I do mean through the shit. 
Yeah. That did not end well. Um, the next one was, uh, uh, he was kind of the, the, the kid on the wrong side of the track, if you will, you know. Just kind of that, we've all kind of known him, or maybe you were him, or maybe you still are him, you know. Just always up to no good. He, he was also unique in the fact that his was the only vampire parent that was his mother. Whereas the other ones, uh, it was their father, which is more common. So his his mother was the vampire parent. So is so he so he had that single dad that was just, um, the way the dad comes off in the Twilight movies of, yep, this is my life now. Nothing I can do about it. My daughter is marrying somebody that's clearly not right for her. But <laughs> what can I do? I tried to do everything right, and the kid still refuses to listen to me for no reason whatsoever. So you know. He's, you know, had some runs with the law in the past, and he, uh, he, he, he got, um, caught because he was in the vicinity of an area where a crime had been committed. Surprisingly, this time, he didn't commit the crime, but, you know, it was, you know, Officer Krubke, if you get the reference, you know, I told you I liked Romeo and Juliet, so this should come as no surprise. You know, the, the stereotypical police officer that's always hassling the kids, always on the kids, you know, always, I know you did something, I know you did something. And it's like, the description said four Hispanic women just robbed a bank. And I know it was you kids, you male kids, you. It's like, dude. <laughs> You know, you, you've got no reason to suspect him, but, you know, he's always that guy, and he was having a bad day, and so he lost it and, you know, collapsed his rib, rib cage in. And then, the, and then there was the third guy. Um, in, in the big story, I'm going to tell there was a fourth one, but I didn't make him, so I can't remember his backstory. But uh, this one was my favorite because um, I put a lot of time into this one. This one was a kid from... Uh, we're going to say a broken family because, you know, he had the stereotypical stepdad. You know the type. The type that, um, in what way did either of these two people get together at all? I mean, I know why they stay because he's got money and, you know... A single mother obviously can't take care of two kids because he was actually twins. Um, you know, but, you know, she's with the asshole now and he's the asshole because, I don't know, he's the asshole. Like in Kingsman, you know, that type of situation. You're like, how did this happen? His backstory was, is he was just having one of those days, you know, where, you know, um, stepdad had just, you know, beat on him because you know mom passed out from her beating because breakfast was on the table at 701 and not seven o'clock so you know hmm. you said you know 20 times in one minute oh have i said that just letting you know okay keep all of them in <laughs> <laughs> so Mommy had to take her beatings because dinner, breakfast was late. And, you know, well, to, to be fair, had she gotten it on the table at 7 o'clock, she would have gotten it beaten anyways because she made eggs, but she didn't make bacon, you know. And who wants who wants eggs without bacon? And come on. It just it just goes together. So Mommy took a beating, but, but Mommy went down early because uh, Daddy used the frying pan. So, um, you know... He had to, you know, go to his son. Because, you know, the son was in the room, you know. He, uh, he got his breakfast at 7 o'clock. Why didn't Daddy? So, he took a beating. Not a serious beating, though, because he, he had to go to school. So, needless to say, that was on his mind. And then he gets to school, but, you know, he's at school now, and he's feeling good because 
like, you know, the stereotype goes with most of those, or at least I think the stereotype goes with some of those is, you know, because that life is shit, he spends a lot of time at school excelling at school. You know, taking extra quick activities at school and doing good in them. A, so daddy don't hit me. And B, because I don't have to be home where daddy will hit me. He has to school that day and, well, he finds out his girlfriend's cheating on him. With his rival. But, you know, whatever. He doesn't care because, you know, it's the day of the big debate because he's on the debate team. I don't know if high schools actually have debate teams or if there are big debates in high school debate teams. I didn't go out for a lot of those. But, so, yeah, so he don't care because he's going to have this big debate today. It's going to be great. And he's going to become school president, and it's going to be awesome. And he's going to get a good scholarship because of the school president and going to get a good job and get his mom out of that crappy situation. And, and yes, yeah, it's, it's going to be awesome. Except he just found out his girlfriend is cheating on him with the guy he's going to have the big debate on. And when the debate comes and... It could terribly, terribly be described as, you know, kind of like a lot of the debates that are going on right now. When, you know, there's one person there who clearly wants to have a by-the-book, by you know, really inspiring debate. But the other guy just wants to throw mud. You know, and everybody's listening to the guy that just wants to throw mud. Because nobody cares. So that's when he lost it. You know, all that stuff, just straw that broke the camel's back. The next thing he knew, uh, one of the podiums was gone. The other one um, had maimed three students. And uh, his debate partner was about um, three inches into the brick wall. That's a bad day. So, yeah, I, I, as you can see, all three of them, you know, anger issues. So, the story eventually goes is they go to Juvie, you know, and then they have, they meet up and they have these big adventures where they eventually become stone cold murderers. So, I mean, we had a lot of fun with this campaign. I really enjoyed it. And I'm going to kind of start talking about the other campaign now because a lot of the beats are the same and I'd just be rehashing stuff because this, this is the one that I want to talk about because while the first one was amazing, this one was even better. I looked at like all the important areas where the first campaign did. There was like the, the, the Juvie Hall, there was the escape from the Juvie Hall, there was an incident at a gas station, there was an incident at a pedestrian's house, there was an incident at a checkpoint, an incident in Chicago, and an incident at uh, another location in Chicago. So I basically just kind of, all right, here's how this is gonna work out. They're gonna be in this area and they're gonna do stuff in this area. Then I'm going to move them to the next area. I get them around, you know, I give them all their character sheets. I tell them all their backstories, same backstories. Uh, the fourth guy, because there was a fourth guy this time, tells me his backstory and I was like, oh, Okay, you know, it works. He was like a, a, a school boxer and got angry and hurt somebody outside of the ring after, you know, the judges clearly, you know, were watching the wrong fight. You know, he, he knocked the guy down twice in one round and still lost the round. That, that type of situation. But they meet up in, in, I just call it, they're in study hall because they got some free time in between classes because, to my knowledge, it's you are in classes or study hall or you're in your cell and I kind of I kind of describe this place as, as basically prison for youngsters which I, I know people, a lot of people say juvie is but it's this one is like more blatantly a prison you know like bars on the windows and bars on the cells you know that kind of thing well, well bars on the windows not bars on the cells but yeah you, you get the idea so I sit them down I give them their backstories I say that you all meet up, you all awkwardly stare at each other at a table, which they were, at this table, all kinds of awkwardly staring at each other, looking at their character sheets, and I say, guard walks over and says, you have 30 minutes of study hall left. But whip out my watch, start. And I just sit back, like this, and just kind of look at the table. And they just kind of look at me, 
And they kind of look around and they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting. And nothing's happening and, 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 and then one of them kind of starts telling a joke or something and then I just hold up this little note card that says guard on it and say, shut up over there! Put the card down and go back to waiting. And, and, and they kind of... Then I, I see the gears turning in their heads. They, 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 they get what's going on. So they kind of start talking and they, you know, they're doing character introductions, you know, I'm, I'm this guy, I'm this guy, I'm this guy, and I'm just... You know, twiddling, twiddling, twiddling my thumbs. You know, drinking my water like I do. I miss my water. Grab my little guard card, pick it up, and just kind of start walking around and kind of holding it out to them as they keep talking. And you're probably thinking here, like, oh, I get it. <laughs> but, and it worked well because it started off and they're just, you know, talking normally. Halfway into it, I, I, I kind of run over the table, pull up this card with Mysterious Stranger, and start talking in this quick voice of like, hey, you guys probably saw it. You guys know what's going on. You know, like, you know, there's something b between all of you. You know, you, you know you've never been right. I can't go into more of it right now because reasons. Uh, but you guys need to get out of here because, you know, bad stuff's going to happen if you stay. And then he gives him like a little note card with an address written on it in Chicago, which this campaign was taking place in Chicago because a lot of my Vampire the Masquerade campaigns took place in Chicago. I have no idea why that was, but it just was. And then I get up and I run out of there. And they're like, well, that was weird. So they start talking about escaping. And I, you know, keep walking around and kind of, you know, yell at them as a guard. And I describe a scene where a jokester gets taken out and beat senseless because he threw a paper airplane at a guard or something like that. And they would ask the guard for something and he'd angrily get it for them. Like one of them asked for a piece of paper to write a letter. And I just angrily grabbed the paper, slammed it down in front of him, handed him a pencil and said, write, write, write. And then he, you know, started writing really quickly. And then I grabbed the paper and said, there, I'll mail your letter. And I just kind of walk off. And apparently it worked because there was a point where they stopped and one of them goes, wait, 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 guys, guys, guys. Why are we whispering? And all of them just kind of stopped and realized they were all whispering. And they all kind of like looked around confusedly. Then they stopped. And all their heads turned to me. And I just kind of sat there. You know, kind of that look on my face. And they resumed the conversation, whispering. And then, you know, the, 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 the half hour was up on my watch. And then, you know, I just moved the scene along. You know, nothing was rolled. Nothing, you know. It, well, okay, I think there was one or two rolls in there. But they were just for kind of like ancillary things. You know. And so I moved them on, you know, to... to to the next phase. They were in the, their, their, their dormitory cells, you know. Um, for some reason, when I imagined these cells, I, I was thinking, which probably explains a lot, I was thinking this, this whole, that, that whole scene from, from uh, uh, Terminator 2 where Sarah Connor escapes, you know. That's what I was envisioning like their, their cells look like, you know. Like, like the big heavy doors with like the small window in them, you know. And so, all right, now you guys have to make your escape attempt. So they start, you know, they break themselves out, you know, and they're sneaking through the holes, and they get spotted by the guards, and, um, brutally beat the guards down. They kind of get down to the second floor, you know, and they're, they're, they're sneaking around, sneaking around, and didn't have to, but they brutally beat those guards down, and they break out of the dormitories, and run into the parking lot, and hijack a car, and off they speed, and as they're speeding off, I kind of look at them and said, all right, you notice that you're running low on gas. You're going to have to, to stop at a gas station. So like, all right. And I said, yep, yeah, there'll be one in about 15 minutes. Once again, started my watch, sat back, just let them have at it. 
you know? And of course the conversation was one of like, oh my god, I can't believe we just did that, I can't fucking believe we just did that, because, you know, they were role-playing as, you know, 16-year-old kids that just broke out of juvie. Like, 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 blazingly broke out of juvie. Like, you know, Escape from Alcatraz style breaking out, you know? They move to this gas station, they rob the gas station, they, as they're driving, they accidentally knock the guy over that's pumping his own gas while smoking a cigarette because it was, this was set in the 90s and you could just do that. And then I move to the next scene. There, there, there's a scene at a, uh, a, a police roadblock that the police have set up because, well, you know, kids escape from juvie. Why wouldn't there be roadblocks? So they got a, you know, I'm like, all right, you know, there's, you know, it's too late to turn around. They've seen you. You've got to go through this roadblock. One of them tries to say, well, I try to turn around. I'm like, you can't turn around. You got to go through. So, you know, they end up murdering the cops at this roadblock. Now they're armed. Now they are armed. That's where it started to get dark. That's where it started to get dark. Um, first place they went, um... I actually hadn't prepared them to, to, to send them to this place, but the last group went there, so I was fine with it. But they went back to their, their homes and um, got some of their stuff. Now, in the original group, the, 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 the academic guy, um, he originally um, uh, got his sister and got out of there and quietly killed uh, his stepfather and then, and then told his step-siblings to just, you know, be quiet and, 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 and spend time with mommy. And the, the cops would be there soon. This time around, no. No, no, they, they, they didn't do that. They just broke down the door, saw stepdaddy, put two holes in him, grabbed a pair, got to change the clothes and left. Which I really felt sad because the sister kind of had her own little subplot in there where the brother became more and more and more possessive of her. Sadly, sadly, sadly that, that, that wasn't happening this time around. But yeah, you know, they just break the door down, put two slugs in them, grab and run. Drive off into the glorious city that is Chicago. Now, and I just moved them right along to the next scene, where they, they, they ditched their car because they were in Chicago now, and the Chicago PD would be looking for them. Which, you know, Chicago PD is going to be a lot more, I guess, alert then, you know, Highway Patrol would, especially at a hastily thrown together, you know, checkpoint. So they're, you know, walking down Chicago, you know, because they're, you know, close enough to this address, you know. And they're on like, you know, a small section of the city block. There's a small alleyway there. And I mentioned that a cop turns its lights on, you know, because it's like 10, 11 o'clock at night. And there's four what appear to be 16 year old kids walking down the street. You know, did the cop necessarily know that these were the four kids that broke out? No, no, not really. But it's just, you know, it's after curfew, so. After curfew in Chicago. Hey, what's going on here? You kids are probably up to no good. They eventually dispatch these cops. Although, the first group did it amazingly and very, very scarily. Um... One of them, like, immediately, like, runs down, just, like, walks down the alley, runs up this fire escape, and kind of gets to the top of the building, and the cop kind of, you know, like, tells his partner to, to, to watch the rest of the kids, and he goes up after him, you know, and he confronts with the top. He's like, hey, where are you going, kid? Don't you run away from me when I tell you to do. And the kid, um, he's got this cane. I can't remember where he got this cane, but he, but he had this cane because the guy that played the character liked canes. But, but he had this metal cane with him. And I'm going to this big thing, you know, blah, 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 blah. And he just says, I hit him as hard as I can. And, you know, so he hits him. And the cop's, like, right there at the top of the fire escape. So he goes tumbling off, tumbling off the top of the building, smashes his head on a dumpster in the alley because there are always dumpsters in my alleys. Yeah, just straight up murders that cop. Um... Yeah, cold-blooded murder. Now, the other group, 
it wasn't so cold-blooded this time around. It was just, you know, blam, 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 blam. But now I've got them. Because now, individually, each one of them, you know, has killed a cop. Make their way to this guy that contacted them in juvie. And he, you know, and, and once again, I'm like, you know, half hour. They sit down and, and they immediately jump and, and they start talking again, you know? And he explains it to them, you know, hey, you guys are half vampires. And then they, you know, and then they finally get to be able to consciously use their cool vampire powers. Whereas before, it was just kind of one of those things where I would decide that, hey, your vampire powers are now active and that kind of thing. He looks outside, sees the cops forming outside, you know, they're, you know, the, the copters are there, SWAT's being called in, and they're like, dude, you gotta help us. And he's like, fuck you, I ain't helping you. Like, this is on your fucking heads, all right? So they, you know, pistol whip him up good, which I could tell they enjoyed more than they should have. First, they got snipers on the roof, and the snipers um, started shooting them up, and one of them decided to bravely stand in the window and shoot the snipers. This surprisingly worked. Then, you know, he got a flashbang in the face, and, you know, SWAT came rushing in. Um, a few brief, very intense, very close combat rounds later, they eventually kill the SWAT guys. Um, and they're like, we need to get out of here now, which is good because now they got all this cool tactical SWAT gear, you know, and armor, which is good. And, you know, MP5s, because if you've ever seen anything that involves SWAT, it's always MP5s. So they, uh, so they, they make a break for it. They, they go up, they go up to the roof. And, you know, they're, they're, you know, they kind of fire at the cops, you know, to get the cops running. And they start doing this really cool scene um, where they're jumping across rooftop to rooftop. One of them, like, he either failed the jump or he was knocked unconscious uh, during the, the, the SWAT attack. Because they get him. You know, they're, 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 the, the cops are able to arrest him while the other ones run away and, you know, they see this um, manhole sticking out of, you know, like one of the back alleys, you know, behind some apartment buildings and they, they go for that. The cops grab him, you know, and they arrest him and, you know, they're, they're not, you know, careful with him at all because, let's face it, this is Chicago and these guys are known cop killers. You can imagine what happened. So they go through this sewer where they finally encounter um, other vampiric stuff. They encounter like these like ghouled rats and abominations down there and one humorous moment where I say that they hear the sound behind them and they all turn around like all right roll your animal can and they all roll their animal can and I'm like one of them succeeded and I kind of turn to them and like all right we'll get to you in a second. I turn to the rest of the group and I say to them, all right, out of the water comes the biggest, meanest, scariest, albino, scarred up looking crocodile that you have ever seen in your entire life. I'm like, whoa. And then I, 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 I turn to the one that succeeded and said, all right, you see this biggest, meanest, scariest, whitest, scarred up looking alligator you've ever seen in your entire life. And the whole table just broke out in laughter because <laughs> they, they, they either laughed or they kind of rolled their eyes and I see what you did there. They fought off this crocodile by um, doing the stupidest thing ever. One of them's like, I'm half vampire and my physiology is different and I don't have to breathe all the time so I jump into the crocodile's mouth. All right, then I uh, use my vampire power of fortitude, which he just picked up fortitude, which was good. He did that because he said he pulls the pin on one of the tactical grenades. Now, granted, yeah, it was a stinger grenade, but I can't, but I for sure can't tell you what would happen 
if a sticker grenade exploded inside of an alligator's stomach. So I'm like, you know what, fair enough. Fair enough. You know. You know, you got the, the outside, you know, I, I turn to the group and say, you know, you see him bravely jump into the maw of the crocodile, and a few seconds later, you hear this, you know, explosion, and the thing kind of puffs up real big, and you notice all these couple of beads shoot out of it. And I turn to the, the, the other guy, and I'm like, you see the, you see him bravely jump into the mouth of the alligator? Cause, yeah, I was doing that the entire time. I would describe it twice, once with the crocodile, once with the alligator, you know, and yeah, I describe that, you know, and I'm like, we, we shoot it in the head, so they just start, you know, blasting this thing in the head, you know, because it seems to have stopped moving, and then they kind of wait, and they kind of hear some sounds, and they kind of, you know, rip open the, alli the crocodile alligator, and then he's like in there, he's like, about fucking time! <laughs> As he's sitting there, he's not looking too good because he just, you know, stick a grenade <laughs> inside an alligator. That's where the campaign ended. And every one of those beats, like, I just took them to them. I didn't let them go there. I railroaded it to there. And afterward, um, like, they came up to me and said that that was the most fun that they've ever had role-playing ever. And I was happy about this. And I guess that's the moral of the story here is, you hear about this a lot online, and there's a lot of jokes about it, and it's kind of seen as this derogatory thing, but no. Railroading works when done right. You can railroad somebody and still have a fun time. I mean, come on. We all love Star Fox 64. It's one of the greatest games of all time. And it's just, with the exception of all range mode. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 but even with all range mode, you know, you can only go so far. You know, and, and that's basically what it was. Is, 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 it was, it was, you know, we fly through Corneria to all range mode. And then I fly you to, 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 uh, Zonus in all range mode, and then you fly to Aquarius with all range mode, and you fly to Solaire with all range mode, and I really like Star Fox 64, if you can't tell. Railroad's not bad. You know, um... So that's the end of that story. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed playing it. Um, at some point, as we are filming these out of order, I will tell a story about something. What story did we talk about? No idea. Yeah. Uh, well, you'll probably hear that story. And then you'll probably hear the story about the trip to D.C. And then after that, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the, the, the story about the Starfighters. Uh, I'm the DM, and... <sighs> Women don't find you handy. They should at least find you handsome. What is with all the red green side us? <laughs> it was a fantastic show and my god you were thirsty. Yeah. Also you sit under bright lights for two hours. <sighs> Something like that. It's kind of weird. <laughs> but no, I didn't realize there was another mutant uh, alligator crocodile incident. I only knew of the one I had with Eddie. Yeah, 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 that's it's a running gag. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. That's probably all being picked up, because... Oh, well. <laughs>